Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse Specialist teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder, previously at UC Berkeley and UCLA. In Old Norse poems and sagas about ancient mythical heroes, the Goths and the Huns play a large role. But who were these peoples and uh, how were they portrayed in the sagas and why? Well, first of all, the Goths are a related people to the Norse. They are both Germanic speaking and the Goths probably originally come from Scandinavia, although the specifics of that uh, are definitely still under debate. The Goths called themselves by the root Gut, which shows up in Old Norse uh, as Gutar or Gotar, and probably in place names like Gotland, the island off the east coast of Sweden. The Gothic language is preserved in a Bible translation and in some other documents from the 300s or so. Uh, this is the oldest long continuous text in a Germanic language, and it shows us a picture of a language clearly related to the Germanic languages attested later, such as English and Norse, but still very archaic in several respects, including that it has not undergone any processes of umlaut. And there is still reduplication in the seventh class of strong verbs. These are highly archaic features in the context of a Germanic language. Now, the Goths themselves apparently told of immigrating from Scandinavia as uh, Jordanes or Jordanese, a uh, Gothic historian writing in the mid 500s, records that they were descended from a certain Berig who had immigrated from Scandinavia to the coast around present day Poland. Uh, but Jordanes account is full of all kinds of references to uh, really clearly uh, inaccurate aspects of ancient history as far as the Goths are concerned, like they're connected to some of the heroes of the Iliad. Uh, at one point they meet an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, so, you know, Jordani's account can't be credited as uh, pure history. But Jordani's does mention some historical figures such as the Gothic king he calls Ermanaricus. This would probably be Gothic Ermanarics. That is exactly cognate with the name we find in Old Norse as Jormunrekr, and in Old English is Eormanrik, and poems such as Deor and Weedseed in the Old English tradition. So some stories that clearly were told by the Goths themselves reached Scandinavia and became part of the Scandinavian uh, heroic material. Not that these people were necessarily even understood, right? Who are the Goths? It's, it's by a thousand years later in Scandinavia, this is just a term for some ancient tribe uh, that had some kind of uh, strong associations with power and ruling and with great deeds. Uh, but it's fascinating to see that, that apparently even though the Goths were down in uh, southeastern Europe and southwestern Europe, uh, in the case of the Visigoths, that there were still cultural and linguistic and probably trade connections back to other Germanic-speaking peoples such as the English and Norse. And of course in English poems such as Weedseef and Deor we also see, as, as I mentioned, traces of stories about Eormanric and also some other uh, Gothic heroes, which I'll get to shortly. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, of course, also write about the Goths in late antiquity. Uh, we read about the Visigoths active in Spain and the Ostrogoths, uh, who in the 300s and 400s were active in the Black Sea region. I'll be focusing on them uh, in one aspect of this video shortly. And the Goths survived as an independent, at least linguistic group in the Crimea, uh, at least probably into the 1700s. In the 1500s, a Flemish uh, bureaucrat named Busbeck happened to record some words of a language that is clearly descended, at least partly from Gothic. There's some controversy over whether it is uh, completely a descendant of, of the Gothic that we know from the Bible of uh, Wolfhill's translation of the 300s, or whether it's also mixed with some other unknown Germanic language, but clearly it's at least partially Gothic. And uh, in the 1700s, uh, 80s, there's also a Slavic bishop who in the Crimea uh, recounted that there was a language that was similar to uh, Plattdeutsch, i.e. Low German, so he must be talking about the same late Gothic, but we have no traces of it after that. Although there are some uh, recent discoveries in the Crimea, uh, just I think in 2015, there were some definitely Gothic graffiti discovered uh, dating from the 800s and 900s by uh, some Russian scholars, and these include a psalm and fascinatingly, the word Midyungarth, which is of course uh, used to translate, uh, or it's actually not even a translation, but it's used to mean earth. And that of course is cognate with the old Norse mythical term, Mithgarth, the realm where humans live. Now, 
among the tribes of Goths mentioned in our classical texts by Romans or, uh, or Greeks, we read about tribes called the Greutingi and the Tervingi. And the Greutingi were, interestingly, among the first people to encounter the Huns along the Dniester River. Now, the Huns are quite different from the Goths, historically speaking. These are not Germanic peoples. These are people from Asia. And we don't even know what language they spoke, although we can infer that it was probably a Turkic language. They raided in Europe in the 300s and 400s. Possibly they were related to the Xiongnu uh, or the Huna, recorded in Chinese and Sanskrit sources, respectively, as raiding in Asia in the first century AD. And of course, they were most famously led by the ruler who is remembered as Attila. But intriguingly, his name, Attila, is not his name in Hunnic, whatever Hunnic was. It's his name in Gothic. Uh, you see, Atta is an affectionate word for father, like dad in Gothic, and Ila is a diminutive, sort of like uh, Cito in Spanish. So you can sort of think of this as Daddy Cito, it's little daddy. It's apparently an affectionate, or possibly intimidated name that the Goths uh, had for Attila. And of course, that same name uh, in its cognate form is Atli in Norse, where he's a big character in the saga of the Volsungs, and uh, Atla in Old English, where he is mentioned in the poem Wheatseeth, where it says, Atla wailed Hunum, Ermanric Gotum. Attila ruled the Huns, and Ermanricus the Goths, remembering these two uh, as closely parallel great kings of ancient peoples. Now, if you know the Volsungs material well, You'll remember that in the very archaic poem Atlakviva and also in the saga of the Volsungs that draws on it, Attila is killed, Attila or Atli is killed in bed by his wife Guthrun, who is a goth. And in fact, there is a story of a Roman a woman named Honoria, sister of the emperor, who sent Attila a ring and requested his help in fending off a suitor. He then claimed her in half of the Western Roman Empire as his dowry, and he uh, pushed through a great deal of the Western Roman Empire before finally being turned back by Roman diplomats uh, before uh, getting too close to Rome. And not long after this, circa 453, he was killed in bed, say some ancient sources, uh, by his Gothic bride named Ildico. Now her name is not very much like Guthru, but the Ild, uh, of course this is being recorded in Latin or, or, or in Greek, I can't remember this specifically, uh, the name is a, a, a Roman or Greek approximation of a Germanic name, so the Ild is probably the element Hild, which does appear in the names of some relatives of Guthrun, including her mother Grimhildr, uh, who has, uh, in, in that equivalent name, Klinhild, in the German tradition of the Nibelungen lead of the Volsung heroes, that is Guthrun. At any rate, it's interesting that there is an old tradition that he would be killed in bed by a bride when that same thing is preserved in the Adlerkviva, which, while a very archaic poem, is still going to be 400 years in its origin later than the events of Attila's actual life. I also think it's neat that she sent a ring to Attila, uh, supposedly, when of course that's what Guthrun does to her brothers to warn them about Attila's evil intent in the Volsung material. Now, one of the most interesting accounts of the Goths and the Huns in Old Norse comes from the saga Hervar Saga of Hedrex, the saga of Hervor and Hedrek. Uh, and this poem, called the War of the Goths and the Huns usually, or sometimes it's called Hloskvi, the poem of Hlother, recounts this battle between uh, Hlother, who is an illegitimate son uh, by a Hunnish woman of the Gothic king Hedreker, against his brother Angantyr, who is the legitimate son of Hedreker, and king of the Goths, and uh, his sister Hervor. And while the saga itself is written in the 1200s, the poem is thought to be among the most archaic in Old Norse, possibly uh, at least in part dating back to the 800s, and it includes some fascinating linguistic material on top of the really archaic Old Norse. There is a reference to some mountains called the Hervada Fjol. A fjol means mountains, but Hervada is fascinating because if you take the word Carpathians or Carpath, Carpatha, and you run it through Grimm's Law, one of the most distinctive early sound changes in the Germanic languages, you would get Hervada. So this is clearly a reference to the Carpathians, but it suggests 
Germanic, possibly specifically Gothic presence in an area where these mountains would be spoken of before these changes of Grimm's Law had taken place. And linguists typically believe that that must have taken place probably by 500 BC. So that suggests possibly an even earlier presence of Germanic speakers uh, in contact at least with peoples in southeastern Europe uh, before we knew that they were there. And of course I wonder about that in connection with the uh, uh, Greek origin that I speculate about for the runes or possibly uh, mediated by some other Eastern European people that we have forgotten about. At any rate, this poem is included in the Saga of Herborn and Heidrek. It is much older than the Saga. The Saga is written in the 1200s. The poem possibly dates at least in part to the 800s, as I said. And so, since I am working right now on translating the Saga of Herborn and Heidrek for my next upcoming book, which will include that Saga as well as the Saga of Rolf Kraki, I want to read to you sort of my first draft of this poem. All right, this translation of the War of the Goths and the Huns, or Hloskvida, is sourced from the poem as it is reproduced in chapters 11 through 14 of the Saga of Hervor and Hathrak. I'll explain in prose uh, parts that are preserved in prose, but I'm not going to read through the prose parts of these chapters. They say Humli once ruled the Huns, Gitzur the Geats, Anguntir the Goths, Valdar the Danes, Kjor the French, and Alrekar the Bold ruled the English tribe. Then Hloth was born in Hunland with a knife and a sword, a long chainmail coat, a ring-decorated helmet, a sharp sword, and a well-tamed horse in the holy woods. Hloth, heir of Heithrek, rode from the east. He came to the enclosure where the Goths dwelled at Orhemar to demand his inheritance. There Angantyr toasted the fallen Heithrek. Hloth found a man outside in front of that high hall late in the evening, and he said, Go inside, man, into that high hall. Tell Angantyr we need to speak. The messenger went in before the king's table and greeted King Angantyr well, and then said this, Hloth the warlike, Heithrek's heir, your brother has come here. That big young man is on horseback, and he wants to speak with you, my lord. There was a noise in the house. The nobles stood up. Each wanted to hear what Hloth would say and what Angantyr would answer. And so Angantyr welcomes him and uh, offers him to participate in the feast, but Hloth says that he's come for a different reason than to drink. And then he says, I want half of everything that Heithrek owned, half the cows, half the calves, half the whistling millstones, half the needles, half the spears, half the treasure, half the slaves, men and women, and their children, half the great forest called Mirkwood, half the holy graves in the Goths' lands, half the lovely stone which stands by the Dnieper, half the armor Heithrek owned, half the lands and men and bright rings. But Augentir says, Brother, first the white shield must break, and the cold spear meet another of its kind, and many a man kneel dead in the grass before I split Tyrving in two pieces, or I give you, son of a Hun, half the inheritance. I will offer you bright spears, money, an abundance of wealth that will please you most, twelve hundred men, twelve hundred horses, twelve hundred servants who each bear a shield. I will give each man many other things, better than he has a right to have. I'll give each man a young bride. I'll put a necklace on every bride's neck. I will measure out silver for you while you sit and weigh you down with gold while you stand. So rings roll off you in every direction and you will have the rule of a third of the Goths. But Gitzer of the Grittings, foster father of Angantyr, doesn't like this and he says, all this to be received by a slave woman's son? He's a slave woman's son, even if fathered by a king. A bastard son sat on a grave mound when a noble-born son shared out his inheritance. But Hloth is angry when he is told that uh, he is a slave woman's son, so he goes home to his own foster father, Humli, who is his grandfather by his mother. And he says, well, no, Humli says, we'll remain here this winter and live happily. We'll judge and we'll drink from freshest cups. We'll teach the Huns to hold their war weapons. Those men later will follow us boldly. Hloth will prepare an army for you well and will bravely make war. The Huns will summon an army of men, 12 years old, and two winter-old foals. And so they gather an army consisting of all the men, 12 and older, and all the horses, 2 and older, from Hunland. When they ride uh, not too long after this into the land of the Goths, the first one to see them is Hervor, Angantyr's sister, who commands the guard post uh, at the border toward Hunland. She tells a certain Ormar, to ride out to the Huns and tell them where the Goths will meet them for battle. And Ormar says, 
I will certainly ride holding the shield and offer war on behalf of the army of Goths. And so Oromar uh, then witnesses the Huns and Goths meet for battle. He sees Herevor fall, and he is the messenger who brings this news to King Angantyr, where he says, I've come from the south to tell you this. The famous forest of Mirkwood is all burned to cinders, and all the Gothic warriors are covered in men's blood. I know that Herevor, Haethric's daughter, your sister, was bent to the earth. It's the Huns who have felt her, and many others of your warriors. She found it easier to go to war than to speak to suitors, or to sit and drink on her wedding day. Angantyr smiles when he hears this and speaks just this couplet. You were treated unbrotherly, you excellent sister. And then he looks over his shoulders and he sees that he has not many troops with him. He says, there were many of us when we drank mead, and now we are fewer when we ought to be more. I don't see a single man in my army, although I might ask and I might buy him with rings, who would ride and bear the shield and seek out the fighters of the Huns. And Gitzer, his foster father says, I will ask you for not one coin, not one jingling piece of gold, but I will ride and bear the shield and offer war to the Hunnish troops. And so he does. As he is riding out, he says to the king, Where shall I show the Huns our battlefield? Angantyr replies, You remember the slaughter at Dunhave under the Yassar Mountains. There the Goths have often made war and famously won victory. So Gitzer rides to the Hunnish army and he says, Your army is frightened. Your king is doomed. Battle flags overshadow you. Odin will be fierce to you. Then he says, I offer you a slaughter at Dunhave, the battle under the Yassar Mountains. You'll each be raw flesh in those high places. Now may Odin let the spear fly in accord with what I say. Floth says, Capture Gitzur of the Gritting people, that man of Angantyr who's come from Orhemar. But King Humli says, We won't do harm to messengers, those who travel all alone. When Gitzur gets back to Angantyr, he asks him how many men the Huns have, and Gitzur says, There are six regiments of men, and each regiment five battalions, and each battalion thirteen squadrons. In each squadron, the men are quadrupled. Well, the Goths and the Huns meet for their battle, and the Goths are victorious. And afterwards, Angantyr inspects the fallen, and he finds the corpse of his dead brother, Hlod. He says, Brother, I offered you an undiminished inheritance, money, and a hoard of jewels, befitting you as a king. Now you have neither bright rings nor even your lands at the end as your battle wages, as your wages for battling. And then he says these famous words, including the preserved poem. We too are cursed, brother, and I have become your killer. This will be remembered forever. The judgment of the Norns is evil. Now, it's interesting to see that quite possibly Gitsur, the foster father of Angantyr, who seems to have some Odin characteristics and maybe understandable as Odin in disguise, uh, he is called a, one of the Gritzing people, the Gritzingaliv, and that may well relate to the Gothic tribal name of the Greutzingi that we read about in classical sources. And also Angantyr's famous sword, Tyrvinger, may be related to the other tribal name we read about in the early conflicts of the Goths with the Huns, the Tervingi. Uh, so that's really cool. And of course, we see many mentions of places in southeastern Europe that were meaningless basically to the Norse uh, reading or recording this saga in the 1200s, such as the Dnieper River. And uh, as I said, the Carpathian Mountains are also mentioned in some of the poetic material in the saga associated with the Goths and Huns conflict. So while the Norse probably didn't have a clear memory of who these peoples were, they did have a memory uh, at least of a close kinship with the Goths, quite possibly uh, at least certainly in Gotland, also of a sense that they had come from Scandinavia originally. And uh, they remembered both Goths and Huns as legendary warriors, including uh, applying names of Goths and Huns to characters that are not clearly actually associated with either people, such as calling Sigurdr a Hun in some of the Volsung material. Well, I hope this has been somewhat interesting and informative for you. I hope that uh, if you enjoy these videos, which are made for free in beautiful places because I don't believe that professional level knowledge about Norse language and myths should be kept in an ivory tower as it so often is. You'll consider looking at my Patreon too and at my translations of the Poetic Edda and the Saga of the Volsungs, which includes the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, and that you'll look for my next translation, which includes the Saga of Herborn Heiderik, as well as the Saga of Rolf Kraki, another legendary ancient Scandinavian hero. For now, from beautiful Wyoming, I'm wishing you all the best.